Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Good morning. Glad to be with you guys today. We are continuing in James today, and one of the reasons that we're in James is because we felt like it was really important for us to engage in some really practical teaching. When, how do we live out our faith every day? I mean, as we've already said in the service today, life is complicated. It has its ups and its downs. There are hard days, there are good days, there are things we celebrate, there are things that are hard for us. When those days come, what does it look like to walk in faith? And one of the most, and arguably the most practical book in the Bible is the book of James. And so James is very much concerned with when the rubber hits the road, how do we live this thing out? And so that's why we're in James. That's why we're engaging James. And today, we're in James chapter one, verses 19 to 25. If you have a Bible with you, um, open it up there. If you wanna grab one of the Bibles that are on the chairs here, if you don't own a Bible, Take one of our Bibles with you. We want to just give that to you. Um, we'll have it on the screen as well in case you know, the Bible print's too small for you. You can see it on the screen. But we're going to start by reading this passage, and then we're going to dive in. So starting verse 19 of chapter 1. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. My goal this morning is to just take this passage, and if there's any part of it to you that feels complicated or complex, I want you to walk away today understanding just what this passage is saying. That is my whole goal. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna just take it in five bites this morning, okay? Um, each bite's not very long, but I think it's the best way for us to dig into this is kind of bite size. When I think about James, I think perhaps James was a philosopher, a person who liked to think about why things work the way they work. Maybe he was more like an engineer love to, to decide you know, how, the, how the stuff functioned on the inside. Or, or maybe it's, it's like childlike wonder. Maybe you can remember when your kids or grandkids or younger siblings went through the phase when their favorite question is why? Why, why, again and again, why, right? And I wonder if maybe James was that disciple, that as he walked with Jesus, he would just keep being like, why, why? And Jesus was like pulling his hair out, you know, no, of course not. But I think... He asked why a lot because he was curious how things work because what we see in the book of James is that James takes these pretty complicated things and breaks them down for us. And I, and I think as much as he might have liked the why, it seems to me like James really enjoys telling us how he has discovered this is how it works, you know? Um, so five parts. The first part's this. The first part is my dear brothers, take note of this. It's the very first little bit of our, of our passage this morning. When you guys engage scripture, when you guys go to study the word, to break it down, to try and understand it, one of the things that can be most helpful and is like an easy thing to do is just having multiple translations. And so maybe there's some of you out there that do have a couple of different Bibles on hand, uh, but an easy way to do it is just using Google, you can type in a verse and any translation that you really wanna look at. The reason that I say that this morning is because you know, we use the NIV here in church. Those are the, the Bibles you sign on the pews. I use the NIV as well. There's nothing wrong with that. And so you know, the NIV starts out, my dear brothers, take note of this. But if you have a King James Bible, 
The King James Bible starts out like this. It says, wherefore, my beloved brethren. It's not that different, right? It's really just a word. The King James says wherefore or therefore. Um, the NIV drops that word. But at the end, there's either a semicolon or a period, all right? And, and you're probably thinking, Nick, are you serious? I'm here to go to church, not to have a language arts lesson. I get it. All right, but hear me out, my friends. Language is art, okay? And sometimes language is choice. And so here's just a little experiment this morning, okay? I have something written on this. I'm gonna turn it around for you to see it. It's written twice. That is not as a trick of any kind, okay? In your head, right, in your head, not out loud, what I want you to do is read it, all right? You decide what this says, okay? Make sense? Pretty easy? Remember, in your head. Hopefully you can see it in the back as well, okay? Everybody seen it? Okay. Now, there's really two ways to look at this. How many people, you can raise your hand, read it this way? God is now here. How many people read it this way? God is nowhere. Okay? Neither one's right or wrong. Okay? I- I'm trying to illustrate a point here. In ancient Greek, ancient Greek is written without spaces, without punctuation, without vowels, okay? So you look at your Bible that you just read along with. Does your Bible have spaces? Does it have punctuation? Does it have vowels? Right, so somebody made a choice somewhere. There's some choices that you can make when you translate scripture, okay? Now the NIV and many translations, they choose to start it with like a command. Know this. They put a semicolon and it's the next part. Know this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry, all right? It's a command, know this. But the King James Version is a little bit different. It starts out and it says, therefore, know that everyone should be quick to listen and slow to become angry. And if you can remember from some of the other things that we've studied, what does therefore do? It tells you to look back, right? So, if we think about what we looked at last week, what did we learn last week, okay? We remembered that God isn't tempting us, right? What's, what's tempting us is us. It's our desire for forbidden things that tempt us. God doesn't tempt us. In fact, every good and perfect gift comes from God. Therefore, be slow to anger. Be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. And I know it's just a little different But one of these is telling us, hey, you should just know this, and the other one's saying, here's the reason why. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. You're your own worst enemy. You know, it's your desires that cause you to sin. So, knowing that, then this. And, And there's not a right way or a wrong way. Either way is fine, okay? But I'm telling you, from my perspective, I like the therefore one. I like the one that refers back. I like the one that kind of leads me to go, All right, the good stuff comes from God. The stuff that I'm struggling with, that is, that's my own struggle. That's not God putting that stuff on me. So knowing that, okay, let me be slow in my reaction, right? Let me be slow to anger. Let me be slow in speech. Rather, let me be quick to listen because of that. So I know it's a little bit, it's just small, but I think that's a helpful thing for us to start off, okay? Second part. We're moving right along. Goes like this. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. All right, that's our next chunk to bite off. Now, last week I showed you my notes, um, and that was really because I was heavily medicated because I had surgery, but I had great feedback from all of you, and so I thought for this little bite, I'll do that again, all right? So, Randy, if you could put the first one up, the first note page, this is, I'll zoom in, don't worry. Uh, This is my notes, and you can see in the upper corner, just verses 19 and 20, okay? So first thing that we're doing 
is we're gonna pick out key words, all right? When you look at this, it says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Already, as soon as you start reading it, there's some tension in that verse. It's like it's comparing two things, right? So I'm looking at words like quick and slow. I'm looking at words like listen versus anger or listen versus speech, right? So those are the words that are gonna stick out to me. Those are the words that I've written down. And if I keep reading, it says all of that stuff does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So righteousness, that sticks out to me too. So I jot that word down too. All right, you can go to the next slide. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump in and just look at each of these words, like we did last week. And we're gonna do it pretty briefly. Last week I spent a good amount of time. This week I'm gonna spend a little less time on it. First word is quick. Now, I don't want to mislead you. This word does mean quick like speedy, like fast, okay? But it also means, as much as it means be fast, it also means be ready. The best picture I can give you to understand this word is not the most pacifist picture I can give you, but think of an Old West gunslinger, okay? And think about being the fastest draw in Kanoi, okay? What good is it to be the fastest draw in Kanoi if my holster is empty? I also have to be ready, right? Okay, so as much as it means fast, it means be ready. So know that. Next word is listen. My Bible translated as listen. It might translate it as hear. It's the word aku. Um, and I don't really know what baggage you bring to the word listen. And that might sound silly, but think about this. Have you been told you're a bad listener? Then you probably bring some baggage to it. Have you been told you're a good listener? Okay, then that's, that's great. We live in a world that doesn't listen very well. We live in a world that demands to be heard more than it teaches how to listen. Would you agree? Okay. So listen is the most like succinct way we could translate this word. But because we live in a world that doesn't know how to listen very well, I don't think the most succinct way is the most helpful way. I think a, a longer, a picture is better for us. And so I wrote down, give an ear to teaching or perceive the sense of what is being said. So hear me, to give an ear, to tune our ear to being taught. We must be able to be taught. How many people here have ever met somebody that you would think, and don't, don't say a name, but you would think, boy, that person is just not teachable. We all have met somebody like, I've been that person, all right? My parents are here, they could tell you. I have been the person who is just not teachable. This means give an ear to being taught, to be willing to be taught, to perceive what is being said. It's not just enough to hear the words. I need to perceive, I need to understand, try my best to understand what they're saying. How many times have you talked to somebody where they've said one thing but they meant a different thing? And sometimes you can like check out some of these like couples that have been together for a really long time and you're like, you hear one of them talk and you're like, they just said blah, blah, blah. And that person, they understood they actually meant this other thing, but I would never have understood that. And you can have mad respect for the fact that they can understand each other, all right? It's not just enough to hear the words. We're perceiving the sense of what is being said, okay? So what this means, be ready to be taught. It's not, I mean, it's fine, quick to listen but be ready to be taught. Be ready to try to understand each other. That is really what James is saying here, okay? So know that. Let's go on to the next, next word. The next word is my favorite word in this, in this passage. Um, it's bradus, and it actually means stupid. All right, so you can, you can think, and I know, I don't use the word stupid. Stupid can be a really bad word, all right? We don't wanna use the word stupid, but in this sense, that is exactly what James is saying, okay? We translate it as slow, but the word is stupid or um, dull, okay? Now, I'm not gonna say any more on that. Just hold that in your head. We'll go to the next word. The next word is speak, and this word means that you declare your mind or you disclose your thoughts. That makes sense, that's what speaking is, declaring your mind or disclosing your thoughts. 
But the sense I get when I read the passage that we're in, but also when I read about how this word's translated, is that it is a person who discloses their thoughts when they're not invited to do so. It's a person who declares their mind when they've not been asked to declare their mind. And so I'm sure we all know people who would fit that category, right? You've, you've just painted an accent wall in your house, they've come over, you're proudly showing them off the accent wall and they declare to you that it's the worst color in the world. Did you ask them what their thoughts were on the color? Of course not, but they felt like they needed to declare their mind to you. We all know somebody who fits that category, right? So I want you to think of this idea of slow or dull or stupid. Um, that is a, that's a person, that's a type of person. Now the next word is anger, okay? That word, it's kind of funny, it, it looks like ogre, which I think is just hilarious, but anger, um, I wrote down a couple words associated with it. Anger, wrath, indignation, and vengeance. Now those are emotions and actions. Anger is a perfectly good translation. The thing that we have to know about this is what I wrote at the very bottom, you probably can't read it, it's kind of faded. The point of those emotions, the point of those feelings, is you desire to punish someone. So that indignation leads you to punish. That anger leads you to punish. That wrath leads you to punish. That it's, it's about vengeance, okay? That's sort of the point. And that's another type of person. We all know somebody who uses their words or their emotions to hurt others, right? Sometimes it's by accident. Sometimes it's because of carelessness. Sometimes it's on purpose. When we're little, we call those people bullies. Bullies get bigger. They don't always change. So we all know these two categories of people, right? So the way we could translate this is we want you to, James wants us to be stupid about declaring our mind where we've not been invited or to be stupid about using our words and our emotions to hurt others. And, and you're probably thinking, what do you mean be stupid? And I'll explain it and I'll stop using that word. I'm so sorry. Um, I mean like this. In your head, right now, I want you to add 591 plus 328 and divide by 6.2. No? I mean, we all have the same look on our face, like we need a vacation right now, okay? We can't do it. Maybe there's one person here that can do it. Most of us can't do it. That is too hard. We're not smart enough to do that in our head. We need our calculator for that. James is telling us that declaring our minds in places we're not invited into to do so, or using our words and emotions to hurt others, should be as hard as trying to do that math problem. Okay? Here's the problem. In our world, in our community, even in our church sometimes, for most of us, anger and hurtful words are two plus two. What's two plus two? Easy. <laughs> Anger and words are two plus two, and the thing that is crazy math for us is listening and being teachable. We've gotten it really backwards. I mean, and we should be willing to admit it, not push back against it, stand back and go, our culture has got this really backwards. We are so quick to snap in anger. We are so quick to use our words, to point the finger, to blame somebody, to, to cast suspicion on somebody, and we are so slow to listen and to be teachable, and this is a problem. It's a problem for all of us, even if you're not the person who's doing it. We live in a world where it's happening all the time. We live in a world that's teaching our children to do it. And if we don't provide an alternative to that, that is what they will grow up with. We can do better. We should do better. As a community that is focused on Jesus, we should do better. We should be paving the way, pointing the way. We should be the ones that are acting completely different. The easy math for us should be listening and being teachable so that when other people see us doing that, they go, boy, that's a really different reaction. I would have gotten totally angry about that. Or I would, have, I would have just given my peace of mind. And instead of doing that, you listened. You tried your hardest to understand 
the other person, the sense of what was being said, not just the words that were being shared. We can do better and we should. Now some of you might remember that at the bottom of my page there was another word yet, and that's the word righteousness. And I think this is a really important word. Very simply, I wrote two things underneath it. Righteousness is the condition acceptable to God and Here's a really important thing, I think. It's justice approved by God. So quick story. I was suspended when I was in high school. I don't tell you this story in any way, shape, or form to, as a joke. I tell you because I can't think of a better example than this. I was suspended in high school for fighting. I was riding the bus, and I was just the right age apart from my sister. She was also riding the bus, but she was five years younger than me, and there was somebody that was bullying her. And I sought to make the bullying stop. And so a fight ensued, and both of us were suspended. All right? Um, What was I doing? When I did that, what I was doing is I was seeking justice. My goal was to enact my will over a situation to stop the bullying and punish the bullier, the, the bully. That was the purpose. I wouldn't have said it back then, but as I look back on it, that was the goal. Let's put this all together, and I think you'll understand why I'm telling you this story. My way of justice is not God's way of justice. I'll say that. Now, let's, let's put this together. Randy, can you bring up the, the, the next passage? starts with the bottom of the screen. We're going to read this together. This is everything we've done so far, okay? So... Your own desire for forbidden things tempts you, not God. Actually, every good and perfect gift comes from God above. Therefore, be ready to be taught and to try to understand others. Be slow to declare your mind where it has not been invited and be stupid about using your words and your emotions to hurt others because your way of punishment doesn't create the justice or condition approved by God. That is what James is saying to us here. Now, I certainly had a way of creating justice. Did the bullying stop? Absolutely. Was God smiling when I struck somebody? No way. My way and God's way are not the same thing. That's what's being said here. And in fact, it's said so very clearly in the book of Isaiah, God tells the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. If I could sum it all up, that's what James is telling us. Remember this, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Sometimes we seek our own version of justice. We use our anger to punish people. We use our words to punish people, especially in situations where instead what we should be doing is listening or trying to understand somebody or be willing to be taught by them. There were a a number of other ways I could have ended that bullying problem. I didn't choose those ways. There's a number of ways I could have ended that bullying problem that would have made God happier. There are ways that we are living right now where we are taking our will rather than God's will and God's instruction and we are enacting it on our life. And perhaps we are accomplishing the ends that we think God wants to accomplish, but our methods for getting there are not God's methods. I think it feels heavy sometimes when you really think about the fact that in my head, I mean, I just, I think about being a teenage boy, seeing that situation on the bus. I had a plan how to fix the situation. My plan worked, but that plan did not honor God. My ways are not God's ways. And one of the ways that we need to grow as individuals, as a congregation, as a church in this country and in this world is learning the difference between God's voice and our voice. When we think about what the next step is in a given situation that we're in, is that God's voice or is it your voice that you're hearing? 
guarantee on the bus that day, it was my voice, not God's. We all need to be thinking about our own lives and thinking about what situations we have going on right now where we're pushing our will rather than listening to what God's will is for the whole thing. And you know what the, the crazy thing is? And, and honestly, the frustrating and annoying thing is is that God's way often takes so much longer. But that's okay. And I realize we live in a world and a culture and a country that values things being expedited. We love our overnight shipping. We love our drive through We love having it now. God's way isn't a drive through window. It's the best sit-down restaurant you ever were. We need to start listening to God's voice rather than ours. Let's go to the next, next part. Um, James says this. He says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And so the first thing we want to mention in this little chunk is it starts with the word therefore. Okay? It refers back. So think of it this way. Since my way isn't necessarily God's way, then I should get rid of all moral dishonor and all malice. And, and a better word for malice, or a better idea, is probably desire to injure. How often is that our answer to the problem? I'm going to hurt them worse than they hurt me. I need to get rid of all moral dishonor and desire to injure, okay, and humbly accept the word planted in me. What's important for us to notice here, I think, is that we're not talking about the Bible. We're not talking about scripture. The word is logos, which is the same word that is used in John chapter one, when John wrote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's the same thing. We're not talking about the Bible planted in you. We're talking about Christ planted in you. So I need to humbly accept Christ planted in me, which can save me. Now, to help make this point, I have a video I want to show you. It's about two minutes long. It's not very long. But I just want you to to take a peek at this as we engage the idea of implanted. Okay? Go ahead. There's no sound, by the way, so don't think that there's something wrong. What you're about to see are clips of people who are hearing for the first time. In each of these clips, there is a stark moment right there where you can see that a person heard something for the first time. Most of these folks are deaf from birth and some uh, from some sort of injury. But watch the range of emotions that is experienced. I don't know if there's anybody in here that deals with hearing loss. Actually, I know there are some. Think about not ever hearing. Think about hearing the first sound, a person's voice. This child seems overwhelmed. And I think about in her young life up to this point, two years maybe, She's been comforted by her dad holding her and touching her, by seeing her dad, and for the first time, she hears the father's voice. How scary and overwhelming that must be for her little one-and-a-half-year-old mind. I think about these moments. It's like the first time we interact with God or meet God. Some of them are overwhelming, and some of them, like this one, we are astounded. This one makes me so happy. Imagine him hearing his mom's voice for the very first time. What that must be like. 
and this little child. <laughs> right? And, but again, overwhelmed. And then a desire to hide myself. And then a desire to reach out to the person who cares for me and loves me. Like, just all these feelings that must be happening as they engage with the world in this way. <laughs> or that, just excitement. Think about the moment that you first met Jesus, that, that day that you realized that your sins have been forgiven, the first time that that really hit home with you. What was your reaction? Was it overwhelmed? Was it, was it wanting to hide because you felt seen for the first time in your entirety? Was it great joy and happiness? I mean, the word that James uses is the word implanted, Christ implanted in me, the word, the logos implanted in me. An implant is something that changes our life. Whatever was before is completely different afterwards. And in fact, in this particular example of an implant, it changes the way we see the world, the way we interact with the world. We're not the same person as we were before. Christ implanted in you should change you. The before and after picture can't be the same. And you might have been the person overwhelmed. You might have been the person who cried. You might have been the, the shaking your arms baby or the one that just dropped your nook because you were so blown away by what was happening. But James goes on to say, don't just listen to the word, but instead, do what it says. And that action word, it means to be a doer, a maker, a performer, or a producer. Think about that. A producer of logos. A producer in this world. Somebody who spreads it, who calls other people to it, who shares it, who shares the implant among others. You are producing it in this world. That's what we're called to. It's not just about I'm going to do the right thing and make the right decisions and all the right actions. I'm actually producing logos in this world. I'm sharing it in a way that creates more of it. You're a maker, not just a doer, a maker. The great creator who created you, who made you in his image, has imbued you with the very same gifts that he has, and one of those is being a creator. You are a creator. Your call is not just to follow him, but also to create in the way that he has created, to create other disciples, other followers, other lovers of him, other folks whose lives will be changed by this insane implant. And I don't know about you, but that revs me up. That gets me excited. It changes the call. It's not just about doing the right thing and putting my feet in the right places. It's like cultivating relationships where people's lives are changed. And to remember in the midst of that that God's way takes a while, which means that when we cultivate those relationships, we're in it for the long haul. Not a mountaintop experience, not a flash in the dark and then it goes out. We are a slow burning ember that's being blown on until it creates a fire here for the long haul. That's the sort of relationship that we're called to. Let's go to the next part. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. And I'm not gonna spend any time on this, this bite because it's pretty simple. James says that if you listen to it but you don't do it, you're a fool. You're foolish. If you put in all the time to study it, to read it, to listen to the sermons, to go to the concerts, to watch those speakers, you do all that and you don't actually do what it says, you're wasting your time and everyone else's. You're, it's foolish. You're being foolish. And that's me being blunt, but it's the honest truth of the matter. Why would you waste your time like that? It's foolish. 
like a person who looks in the mirror and can't remember what it looks like. So the last part, here's our last section, part five. He says, but the man who looks intently, or woman, by the way, looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it, not forgetting what he has heard, but actually doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. And, and, and people, when they read that, when they look at that verse constantly, I, I hear them ask the question, they wanna know about this idea of the law of freedom. That's the thing that jumps out to people. And, and I think maybe it should, but I don't know that we always really understand it. Um, some translations say the law of liberty. I actually think the NIV does a pretty good job because it doesn't say the law of freedom or the law of liberty. It says the law that gives freedom. Some people translate this as the law of liberation, which I really like that way. The law of liberation. What's it liberation from? It's liberation from Jewish law. It's liberation from Jewish custom. It's liberation from sin. Liberation from guilt. It's liberation from wrath. It's liberation from death. But even more so, and more specifically this morning as we look at this passage, it is liberation from my way. Whatever my way is to you this morning. And I hope that I created enough of a picture that as you think about my way, there's something that is going on in your life or a regular practice that's going on in your life that you think, yeah, that's my way. That's what, that's what the Holy Spirit is engaging me on right now. So I don't know what is my way for you. But you should know that you have been liberated. That you are free from using anger and vengeance and words and emotions to enact your own kind of justice. Because God's, God's justice is better than your justice. God's ways are not your ways. You are liberated. You're free from making listening and being teachable the really hard math problem. In fact, you're liberated to listen more and you're liberated to be more teachable. You're liberated to make anger and hurtful words so complicated to access. You are free to almost be stupid in the way that you have access to those things. In fact, what's more than that, you are liberated and freed to lay those things aside completely. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And that word vengeance could actually be translated as right ordering. Putting things in the right order is God's job, not your job. You're free to remember that your way doesn't necessarily bring about God's way. So James finishes verse 25 here. He says, the one who is freed will be blessed in what they do. And that word blessed just takes us right back to the Sermon on the Mount where he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. But blessed also, according to James, is the one who is freed from their way and instead takes God's way and plant it in them. God's way has been implanted in you so that you can see anew. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.